So it's six o'clock, I think, here. Ten. Uh, now what time is it in, in the U.S. in the in New York? Twelve it's noon. <laughs> noon. It's noon, right? Okay. So it's uh, this is the last, very last talk of the Granada seminar, but not least, of course, all the other way around, actually, in my opinion. And now it's a pleasure to introduce you, you hi too. Um, it's an old friend of, of mine. He graduated in the, from the gifted child program at the University of Science and Technology back in China. And uh, in the very same year, he went to UCSD to San Diego to graduate in physics. So he did his PhD there under the supervision of Herbert Levine, if I am right. And uh, he got some award from Caltech for his, uh, for his postdoctoral research. And immediately after he got a permanent position at IBM in Yorktown Heights, New York, where we actually met. I just arrived as a postdoc and he just got a permanent position right at the same time. And uh, he has been the manager of the theory of computational physics group at IBM since uh, my, for almost 20 years now. He has been uh, a fellow of the American Physical Society and, and many other things. His research interests are statistical physics, nonlinear dynamics, surface physics, most, I mean, also biological physics. And he has applied his analytical and computational skills in a diverse set of areas and accomplished many highly original work like the Donner 2 equation in flocking theory that we heard about in the previous talk, the genes at work pattern discovery for RNA microarray analysis, the standard model for bacterial chemotaxis, and the energy speed accuracy trade-off in sensory adaptation, biochemical oscillations, synchronizations, etc. In many cases, his pioneering work has opened up new directions of research, for example, in collective behavior, in active matter and pattern discovery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, just to finish, in 2020, last year, he got award, awarded with the Onsager Medal for his seminal work on the theory of flocking that marked the birth of and contributed, I'm sorry, and contributed greatly to the development of the field of active matter. So, Yuhai, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's, we are all yours. Okay, thank you so much, Miguel, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, uh, it, it's my great pleasure to, to be here. I heard it's a wonderful place in Granada this time of the year, so I'm looking forward next time I can visit in person. Uh, in any case, so uh, as Miguel said, that uh, my interest has been mostly in statistical physics, but since early 2000, uh, I shifted my focus towards uh, looking into biological systems. And so today's subject is really about uh, how do we understand biological systems? I call it biological biochemical machine, but these are really just biological systems through the lens of non-Euclidean thermodynamics or non-Euclidean statistical physics. Uh, the subtitle is, is sort of really says what I'm trying to understand is uh, how many ATPs does it cost to run a functional biochemical circuit? So uh, in, in this journey, which started in early 2000, uh, I have many, many collaborators, which uh, who I, I'll, I'll acknowledge during my talk. But the special thank really goes to Howard Berg, who 20 years ago really just sort of started, uh, sort of inspired me to think about, and also taught me many things in, in biology that allows me to sort of uh, uh, encourage me to try to understand the deep connection between physics and biology in various wonderful biological systems ranging from uh, chemotaxis sensory system to bacterial flagellar motor. These are all wonderful biochemical machines as we will see. Um, so, okay, let's, uh, uh, let's start the talk. Um, before I start, I, I would like to always like to show this, this uh, uh, question, which I call the Schrodinger's question. So for physicists, I think uh, uh, ha many physicists have been started interested in biology uh, and, and we are certainly not the first generation and people like Schrodinger uh, in 1944 has wrote a, written the book. Uh, he wrote a book in 1944 with the title, very provocative title, What is Life? So this is a time when he sort of understand the, the, the physical world. I think this is what it, and this, the, the, the premise of this, this title is, is that now he's, he's focused at that time, they shifted to living system. So the question, I think, the central question he was posting 
uh, with really how our living system or biological system is different from non-living, namely physical system. So he has many thoughts in that book. Many of them turned out to be not so correct because he just didn't have the, the information to actually get to it. Uh, but one thing for sure, he got it right. Namely, life feeds on negative entropy. That's the very word or translated words. Uh, basically, life costs free energy. So that has been really the, the sort of the, the, the overarching um, theme that for our work for the last uh, maybe 20 years or so in biophysics. Uh, in specifically, what the central question for us uh, has been, how do living system process information accurately with these very noisy molecular components and stochastic uh, processes, namely kept biochemical reaction uh, with, with small number of molecules and the stochastic reaction processes, thermal fluctuation and ranging from that to noisy, noisy and neuron firing in the brain. The question is really, how does biological system use these very, not so very precise components and not so very precise uh, procedures to actually do something quite amazing and accurate. For example, you can think about DNA replication. You can pop, pop, think about pattern formation in development. You can think about uh, uh, circadian rhythm, the time ordering time. You can think about higher order, you know, sort of processes, information processes like learning and memory and so on. So the first question you always, we always ask is that, what is the molecular mechanism and the underlying design principle of the circuit that actually allows you to do that? And then today I'm gonna to mostly tell you about is how much. Uh, once you know, how does it do it? And the next question that we wanna ask is how much energy does it cost to carry out those functions through this circuit? Um, so, so a little, 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 little detour, I think people, you heard about this, uh, 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 in, in this seminar series, uh, uh, in a different context, uh, for example, for, for uh, 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 some talk by uh, uh, Jezinski that uh, about Landau's principle. So this kind of question, how much does it cost, energetically cost, to actually process information has been asked before, right? In this sort of obscure journal uh, called IBM Journal Research Development, uh, in July of 1961, this is the title uh, for uh, by Ralph Lam a paper by Ralph Landau says uh, the, the title says irreversibility and heat generation in the computing processes. Um, von Neumann also wonder about the same problem in his very last days of his of his life about uh, the the difference between the brain and the computer in terms of uh, computing cost and so on and wiring. So in this very famous paper now uh, 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 by Ralph, uh, my late colleague uh, at IBM, he has he proposed a long, what, so, what now they call the Landau's principle. Basically it says each bit of lost information, erasure of information will cost a minimum of KT log two of free energy. So, so that's sort of, that's the spirit we want to approach biological system, right? So we want to know uh, the, the energy cost of information processing in biological system, of course the biological system just, it's not just amount to erasing, erasure of a bit. It, it, it has to do very different things like uh, uh, gene expression, you have to uh, uh, use, uh, you have to replicate a DNA sequence by, by, by using template coupling and so on and so forth. So in, in that line of thinking, this question about energy cost of information processing in a biological system has been done, has been worked on before. Uh, in, in the 70s, it's just not presented that way. So I'll give you an early example uh, after this uh, uh, introduction. Let me continue with the introduction. So if, if you think about free energy use in living system, uh, let's, let's open up a textbook uh, in biology and, what, and, and look at what biological uh, biologists study this problem and what they think about uh, the energy use, use, uh, use of energy in various uh, uh, biological processes. Uh, for example, the very simple thing that comes to mind is uh, molecular motors, right? Here I depict a kinesin working on a microtubule and the kinesin molecule will actually, this two-headed two or two, two, two feet molecule, we actually burn ATP so that it can, it can actually carry a load, right? On a track, this track is, is a microtubule. 
Um, also, bio, bio, the biological synthesis, if you want to make bonds, you suddenly need energy, right? So that's sort of the obvious use of energy, which you can imagine. Indeed, if you open up the textbook, uh, this one is by, by Bruce, Bruce Albert, and it actually tells you that, okay, you harvest energy through metabolism, right? Light photosynthesis or, or other, other uh, processes that allow you to harvest energy. And in the, in the form of ATP, and you, you, you carry that and, and, and uh, the metabolism, the end product is, uh, is ATP. ATP is a really universal energy currency living system. And you use ATP uh, uh, to do various things, synthesis, transport, motility, pump and heat and so on. Right in here, he forgot. I mean, Bruce. I'm pretty sure he's aware of this, but it, it didn't put in the category of information processes, which I put in here. Basically, what what my uh, the, the 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 sort of the, the overarching theme the, of of our research is that actually the sort of regulation, control, memory, computing, this sort of information processing in in the living system also costs energy, and it has a lot to do with actually the function of those biological systems that carry out these processes. Okay, so let's go move back to sort of engineered system that we are familiar with, the man-made system, right? And which are designed to consume energy to carry out desired work. And again, we're very familiar with uh, mechanical motion, let's say car, engine, which you have to pull in some uh, fuel and, uh, and, and, and you can, you can, you can, you can uh, burn those fuel to make, uh, to actually allow you to do work. But don't forget, you also have another type of machine, right? Computing machine, like computers. And actually, uh, this is actually an old statistic. 2018, 5% of all energy consumed, consumption in the US goes to running computers. I'm pretty sure this percentage has gone up uh, 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 by, by now. Okay, so equivalently, we also have biological machines. In the mechanicals, on the mechanical side, you have this, you know, the shown here is a, is a flagella motor bacteria for Jala motor about 50 nanometers uh, diameter at all its components, it burns energy. In this case, it's actually not ATP, it's the proton flux. It's the proton gradient that actually provides energy for the bacteria, you know, bacteria for Jala motor. And of course, you have, on the other side, you have the, what, what I call information processor. These are computing machines that actually uh, carry out all kinds of different things, bio, biochemical network do various things like in here, I depict the system that does actually chemotaxis uh, signal processing uh, uh, in bacteria. And this is a di diagram of a, of a, a neural network uh, in the brain. So now, so again, we can ask the question, what is the energy cost of running these biochemical uh, system circuits? Uh, so I can, let, let me go jump in to, to, to lecture at a real early example of this kind of question can be asked, right? So the first question is say, how does it do it, right? Uh, and, and it turns out uh, there's a very famous example, uh, kinetic proof reading. I'm pretty sure many of you knows about the example. Uh, in, 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 in the 70s, uh, John Hopfield, a physicist, actually come up with an idea to do kinetic proof reading in chemicals, in biochemical synthesis processes. The question is, is the following that if you just look at the, the, uh, the DNA replication process and you just look at the, uh, the, look at the error rate, right? How, how, how often do you make the error? And, and you say, if the error is only uh, there because the base pairing, the correct base pairing energy is actually lower than the incorrect one, right? Therefore it's more preferred. Uh, so e to the minus delta G over K, KBT, then you'll get a, a, a error rate P which is about 10 to the minus three. But 10 to the minus three is not what you observe. In, in biology, you observe something like 10 to the minus six. So how does, it, how does it go from 10 to the minus three to 10 to the minus six? So John Hockfield and, and Jack Neal actually proposed a very ingenious but simple uh, uh, biochemical processes. Basically, once you make a base pair, you don't immediately go to the next one. You actually check it. The way you check it is you shake it. You shake it by putting some energy, uh, by, by burning some ATP. Once you shake it, the, the one that is loosely bound, right? The, the incorrect one, we actually have a higher probability to, to get, get de detached. So this is probability go detached and, and you do it again. So they call this kinetic proofreading process. So it basically amounts to 
introducing a, another biochemical, another route from going to C, C star back to the original C plus C, okay? So that's sort of the, the very famous kinetic proofreading scheme that uh, uh, these two, two gentlemen proposed. Not too, uh, not too uh, 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 much later, five years later, uh, my colleague, uh, Charlie Bennett has come out with a, written a paper. I don't know, this paper is probably not so well known. It's called Dissipation Error Trade-Off in Proofreading. Basically, he took the scheme and the variation of the scheme of kinetic proofreading for chemical system and he wondered, he asked the question, how much, what's the thermodynamic cost of kinetic proof rating? And what is the free energy dissipation? What's the cost for that process, right? So this is the spirit that we're gonna do uh, for, the, for the remaining of my talk. I'm gonna follow this line of, line of thinking. Okay? And the foundation of this, I have to jump back a little bit again. The foundation of this line of thinking is really rooted in sort of uh, 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 the way people try to understand uh, reaction, chemical reaction, and response of, of, of system uh, uh, and reversible versus irreversible processes. In, in this very famous paper by Lars Onsager in 1931, which won basically, he proposed a reciprocal relation, which won him the Nobel Prize in chemistry, by the way. Uh, he proposed the famous Onsager reciprocal relation, you know, this, you know, symmetry, symmetry between L12 and L21, uh, the response coefficient, right? Now, if you, if, you, if you go through the paper, right? In section three, you also have analogy with chemical reaction. So he actually, the first one to propose is chemical reaction from A to B and B to C, the cycle cyclic reaction scheme. And he says, well, if the detail balance is satisfied, which is basically written here, detail balance is that the, the flux going this way is the same as flux going this way, written here, then you will get this, so-called cycle rule. He didn't call it a cycle rule. Chemists later on called the cycle rule. What is a cycle rule? Cycle rule says in equilibrium system where detail balance is obeyed, in this cyclic, in, in, this, in a reaction cycle, if you multiply all the rate going one way, let's say clockwise, it has to be the same as the product of all the rate going the other way, counterclockwise, right? So that's the cycle rule. So that, this is all I copied from his paper, right? This is a cycle rule. Now, Fast forward uh, uh, to the 70s and 60s, people start to think about this problem in biological system, which is obviously out of equilibrium. But how do you even think about this problem quantitatively? So here comes my other hero, Terry Hill. Uh, I don't know how many people know about Terry Hill, but he really is the one who introducing this sort of free energy transduction, free energy dissipation into the realm of biochemical reactions. So in this, in this nice little book written by Terry Hill, he has, again, this example that proposed first by Onsager, A, B, and C, except that, well, he said, well, in biological system is out of equilibrium. The way you think about systems out of equilibrium is basically by couple one, at least one of the reaction, or it could be many of the, of the reaction to a external reaction that burns ATP. So this is the ATP hydrolysis reaction that ATP goes to a lower energy molecule ADP plus an inorganic phosphate. Right, this is ATP hydrolysis. If you couple one of the reactions with that, then the violation, the detail balance is violated and the cycle rule is violated, which is measurable, right? You can measure all these rates. And if the, if the rate, the product going one way is not the same as the product going the other way, you know detail balance is broken, you know cycle rule is broken. And as a consequence of that, you are twofold. One, even in the steady state of this reaction network, you have persistent current. In other words, if the system satisfies detail balance in the steady state, you won't have any net flux going one way or the other, right? That's what very definition of detail balance. But in this non-equilibrium study state, I call non-equilibrium study state because it has a persistent current, J, in the steady state, right? And that's the, that's the current. Now the thermodynamic driving force for that, you can also compute, isn't that, but it's nothing but uh, 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 the driving force is KBT times log, the ratio between the product going one way versus the rate, uh, 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 product going the other way, right? So only, so, and then from, from this quantity, you can define a free energy dissipation rate. And this, without the KBT is nothing but the entropy production rate in other literature, right? Which you heard about during this, this uh, conference, the seminar series. Now, 
uh, 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 if you write down just J times the thermodynamic force, you get the, what, what, uh, what Terry Hall called the free energy dissipation rate. And that is, you can show pretty clearly, it's a positive definite number and it's only zero, the equi equi equal to zero only when cycle rule or detail balance is satisfied, right? So that, that is really important to realize that this is really a dissipation rate that's a positive number. Um, and, 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 and the consequence is basically uh, the, the general statement that continuous energy dissipation or power consumption is needed to maintain a non-equilibrium steady state. This is a non-equilibrium steady state where detail balance is broken. Okay, so I would, I will, in the fall, the remaining of my talk, I would use this quantity, which I call free energy dissipation, defined in the previous slide, uh, uh, to look into various biological systems, realistic biological systems, uh, to try to understand the relation between the cost, thermodynamic cost, and the function of these biological systems, biological circuit, if you wish. In this, in the list of systems, I'll go very quickly to the first three, and then we'll focus, spend a little bit more time on the synchronization, more recent example, and we'll not talk about at all about pattern formation. Okay, first example, very simple. Uh, uh, the first example that uh, I personally worked on, we worked on, is this this very interesting observation, starting with a very interesting observation by Philippe Puzel and Stein Leibler in 2000, where they they look at the the response of the uh, uh, flagellum motor. Flagellum motor, by the way, have two rotational orient, uh, two rotational direction. One is clockwise, the other one is counterclockwise. And the, the, the probability of spending time in counterclockwise versus clockwise, the switch itself depends on the signaling molecule called KYP, okay? The KYP molecule uh, will, will control the counterclockwise bias. That's what this plot is showing, but uh, uh, in this very, uh, uh, the very first single molecule kind of measurement, uh, single, uh, single cell measurement, uh, Philippe Puzel was able to show that this response function is extremely sharp with a Hill coefficient around 10. Very, very sensitive. So that's why they dubbed the word the ultra sensitive bacterial motor switch, right? So what we did very, very briefly, if you want, you can look at this 2008 paper. Uh, we found that we, we show that through a later, by looking at the later experiment about the, the, the switching pattern itself, the dynamics, the switching pattern itself, we show that detail balance has to be broken in the underlying mechanism. And therefore there has to be a cost. And not only we show that, we show that the cost, delta W, cost per switch, the energy cost per switch is directly related to the health sensitivity characterized by the health coefficient falling this way, right? So in other words, the higher the sensitivity you want, the more energy you need to spend per switch. Okay, that's basically this, this study. The second study, main study we, 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 we did on, on, along this line is in the sensory system itself. In sensory system, uh, it, it, all sensory systems have adaptation. Basically, if you put in stimulus in and uh, after a while, the system adapt to its original activity level. and, and and uh, the, again, first we figure out the mechanism itself. So it turns out the mechanism is very much can be described very well by a, uh, a negative feedback loop, like what is shown here. This is the input, this is the output, and there's a negative feedback through an internal variable, which I call memory, or in, in real biology, it's methylation level of the receptor. And you can control the system in such a way that it actually can not only carry out adaptation, but an adaptation with a high accuracy. I'll show you exactly what I mean by high accuracy. But anyway, uh, we have a very explicit model viewed based on real biological information. If you want, you can look at these papers for details, but this is what I wanna tell you today, that in this system, this is what we describe by a, uh, a, a adapt adaptive behavior. Basically, at t equals zero, here you add a stimulus. To the system. And immediately the system has a response, but after a while it recovers to its original level with some error, epsilon defined by delta A divided by A0, which is the pre-stimulus level, A0, right? 
So, and it adapts with a time scale tolerance. What we are able to show in this paper is that, again, detailed balance is broken in the underlying feed, negative feedback mechanism for adaptation. And as a result, and of course, after some calculation, we were able to show that the entropy production rate, this is W dot divided by KVT, is directly related to adaptation speed, inverse adaptation time, times the log of the accuracy, basically it's one over epsilon, right? With, a, with the order one constant that depends on A0. So it's a, it's a system specific order one constant. But this is the most interesting part that the dissipation is directly related to adaptation speed and adaptation accuracy, the two quantity that characterize the performance of the adaptation itself. So the cost and performance relationship is established for this sensory system, a uh, sensory adapt adaptive system. Okay. Very quickly for, we're getting close to what I wanna focus on. We also looked at how dissipation is being used in authoritary system, in a system that can actually, in biochemical system that has oscillation. For example, we looked at replicator model, we looked at the brassilator model, we looked at the glycolysis system and all of that, in all of these, we look at the system that has oscillation, but we look at the, the accuracy of the oscillation, by which we mean that the accuracy of the oscillation can be characterized by the fluctuation of the phase, right? We call the phase accuracy. Again, the phase, because the time translation is still a, a invariance of the system, it can, be, it can be described by the, what we call the phase diffusion constant, D. So what we found in all these oscillatory systems is that the phase diffusion constant is inversely dependent on the free energy dissipation per period, per cycle, right? Following this formula. And this basically uh, applies to all the systems that we have studied. Oh, last. Okay, now I arrive at the place where I wanna take a breeze and, and just relax and tell you a interesting story about energy, the function of energy cost, namely the cost of synchronization in the context of synchronization of circadian clock. Circadian clock is very, very important biology. Actually, the 2017 Nobel Prize was awarded to uh, the work by three, three people that worked on uh, a circadian clock. Those are in fly. But the simplest circadian clock that in the world, right, is the is the circadian clock in cyanobacteria. It's a bacteria roughly the size of E. coli, you know, size a few microns long and diameter about one micron diameter. It's rod shaped uh, 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 bacteria. That if you look at, if you measure, uh, let's say these are different uh, 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 phosphorylated form of different protein uh, concentration. And if you look at over time, so this is 24 hours, right? And you see that has a very distinctive period of 24 hours for all of them. They are different phases, but they all have the same period, 24 hours. It's amazing. And, and the field really got a breakthrough, but this is a very complicated system. There's many genes involved in vivo systems, it's quite, quite complex. But if you look at the system, the a real breakthrough comes in 2005, where um, uh, uh, Chako Kondo in Japan uh, figure out that you actually can do this in the test tube. So basically he can reconstitute the whole circadian oscillation in bacteria by using three gene, three protein, chi A, chi B, and chi C, and you put them in the test tube in some proportion to each other. Does it oscillate? It does, but only when you're adding ATP, right? So you mix ATP, chi A, chi B, chi C in some proportion to the test tube, and this is the result, the oscillation at the end. And people, of course, know a lot more about the system. They know that the Chi-C hexamer is the one that actually oscillates in terms of the phosphation level. And the, uh, and the Chi-C actually forms the hexamer with six monomers. Each monomer will have two sites in the C2 domain that uh, T432 and, and S431, which can be phosphorated and dephosphorated. And that indeed is the 12 o'clock uh, the, 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 uh, the cycle. Basically, every one of these uh, uh, residues can be phosphorated and dephosphorated, right? That's two. Multiply by six, that's 12, right? That's basically the 12 hours. 
during daytime. And the dephosphorylation corresponds to the, to the night out, night 12, the 12 hour during the night, right? So that's basically, roughly speaking, is, is, a, is a 12 hour cycle, a 24 hour cycle. Actually, indeed, in, 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 our, in our 2015 paper, we were able to just sort of sim have the most simplest model for the system is basically can be captured by this Poisson clock model, we call it, right? Each point, green point, corresponds to a, uh, a state, a chemical state, and the chemical state can go to the next chemical state and, and come back. So this a transition is reversible. And if the transition is purely reversible, then you don't get a clock, you just get a random walk, right? So what do you do with energy is that you couple the forward reaction with the ATP hydrolysis. So forces only go forward. Uh, and, and also you can suppress the reverse reaction by ATP hydrolysis also. And that was basically you prevent the reversal of time. And if you put in enough of these states in, and you can get actually pretty good clock. So that's sort of the basic model that we use to illustrate the point that this it, the use of ATP can be used to suppress uh, phase diffusion, right? Now that simple picture, if you apply it to real realistic system, you actually come up with a very interesting puzzle. If you look at one monomer of the hexamer, I see hexamer, it goes into this cycle by it, of itself. So you have totally unphosphorated, you have two sites that can be phosphorated, right? And first the T site gets phosphorated, and then the S site gets phosphorated. Now this one is doubly phosphorated. So it's phosphorylation, phosphorylation second time, and then the, the night time corresponds to dephosphorylation of the T state and dephosphorylation S state, and you go back to U, right? So this cycle is understood. It's fine. Now, the puzzle is that it looks like if you just believe in this, in this cycle itself, it looks like you only need two ATP, right? One ATP is uh, 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 used for phosphorylation T, another one is used for phosphorylation S in one per cycle, right? Uh, for per monomer per cycle. Now, when people actually went there, in 2007, people actually measured how many ATP is used up per high C monomer per day is 16, much larger than two. The question is, what are the other 14 ATPs useful? That's the puzzle. Okay, so we always have this puzzle in mind, but what the question we really wanna answer, ask is that, okay, uh, following our previous work that we can, we figure out that uh, uh, using a, uh, a Poisson clock kind of model, we can actually figure out how the clock works for a single clock, right? And, uh, and using the cycle rule, we know that the single clock will cost energy because if you multiply all the rate going one way, clockwise, right? Literally speaking, multiple, uh, divide by all the rate going counterclockwise, it should be uh, uh, not equal to one, right? So that's, that's the energy cost for a single clock. Now, single clock has the problem that if you, if you, if you have a lot of noise, then the clock, even though you, you can start with the same time, it will quickly, quickly go out of sync. Right? So how do you deal with that? Well, theoretically we say, well, let's put in coupling, right? That's the standard trick. So let's come up with a model with a coupled clock. So the way you put a coupled clock is basically says, oh, each clock is defined by its phase. So you can go, uh, uh, so this is on a torus, it lives on a torus and it, going one way corresponds to one clock moving, ticking forward, going the other way moving corresponds to another clock ticking forward. Let's put in a diagonal interaction, meaning that they can actually exchange the phase information, right? Just putting some kind of phase exchange to reaction. So the phase can be, can be characterized by how often you do that phase exchange and how strong you do that phase exchange by strength and the frequency, right? Omega and E zero. And you quickly find out once you introduce this reaction, you also introduce another breakdown of the cycle rule local, right? So from going from here to here, you can go to this path. You can also go to this path. If you look at the difference between the two passes, you find that there's a breakdown of detail balance because of the introduction of this exchange reaction, right? So this additional cost corresponds to that. So indeed, this model can be very well developed. And it actually, amazingly, in the mean field limit, if you assume everybody's interacting with everybody else, in the mean field limit, it actually can solve it 
Exactly. So this, you can solve the multi plot problem in the mean field theory by solving the focal plant equation exactly. And the result is actually pretty amazing. <laughs> the result is nothing but the Boltzmann distribution of the, of the uh, total energy, if you include the exchange energy, but the only thing different from the Boltzmann uh, uh, distribution is that the temperature, right? The effective temperature, I call it effective temperature, beta minus one is one. One is the, or the thermal temperature plus K over omega. Remember, omega is the uh, 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 exchange frequency, right? So it actually decreases with exchange frequency, right? Decreases to, to, towards the, the one, which is the original thermal, thermal temperature. Okay, so we can take this model. We study this, the order parameter R, the synchronization order parameter R, how it depends on the exchange frequency omega and, uh, uh, and the exchange interaction strength E0. And you find this typical phase diagram. You go from asynchronous phase R equals zero to R bigger than zero, right? R depends on E0 and omega, order parameter. This you can solve exactly in the mean field. Room. At the same time, again, remember, we can be based on the breakdown of detail balance. And, and also, if you go to solving focal Planck equation, you see the uh, the, the, the manifestation of detailed balance breaking is that you have this net uh, uh, current J that's become not zero. And because of that, you have, you, you have energy dissipation. And then you can from the, uh, 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 these two current type of current, you actually can compute the dissipation rate, right? Dissipation rate, and you can even separate them into the processive energy meaning that each single clock takes energy to run and the coupling takes energy to maintain, right? So this is separated into the exchange energy cost and the processive energy cost. And if you just focus on the excessive energy, uh, the uh, coupling energy cost, what we call exchange energy cost, you can also plot that, show that depends on both the omega, the, the frequency of exchange, as well as the interaction strength, right? Now, we can do the following. Uh, so we say, okay, let's fix E0, let's change omega. And then we plot, we, we look at how does the, uh, uh, the order parameter R changes with the energy cost, right? So we look at that, we use the energy cost as the control parameter uh, versus the, the order parameter. We look at the phase diagram, uh, we look at the phase transition that way. Then immediately you see that, of course, I mean, for, for a given E0, you have a transition happening in different places. So you cost you different amount of energy to even have the onset of the uh, synchronization order happens at an energy cost that depends on E0, right? Now you can actually ask the question, so what is the maximum amount of uh, order you can create for a given amount of W, right? Energy cost, if you say the cost is fixed I only have this energy budget. Can you create the, the, the highest synchronization you can ever possibly can? You can answer, you can answer that question and, and, we, and, and we, can, we can have all kinds of asymptotic behavior and critical behavior based on the maximum order you can create with the energy cost. And this is, and, and accordingly, what kind of choice of frequency and strengths of exchange energy uh, exchange uh, a reaction you need to pick in order to achieve this optimum uh, performance. So you have optimum design law, we call it. Okay, so back to reality. So what is the, uh, uh, what really happened in, in the biological system? How do they really synchronize each other? So again, back to experiment. In 2006, these, uh, uh, using a very ingenious way of looking at the system, they find that the hexamer, I told you about the hex, high C hexamer, it doesn't just stay forever. They actually change partners, change members. So in other words, they measured by some technique that I don't want to bore you with. It's a beautiful technique. They actually were able to figure out if you start with these two types, these two hexamer, after some time, they actually have what they call the monomer shuffle. In other words, the monomers will actually change. The, 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 it, 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 it is a membership from one hexamer to another hexamer, right? So this is monomer exchange. So that immediately, 
show us a way to understand, maybe understand the puzzle, going back to the original puzzle. So we use that idea that, okay, so for individual clock, we have the processive motion of getting phosphorylated and dephosphorylated. But that's the basic, the idea based, uh, based on individual uh, uh, kite uh, hexamer, the processive clock is this one, is this clock, right? But in addition, we're putting exchange coupling between two hexamer, changing partners, right? Like from, from this state to this state, mixture. And that mixing is exactly uh, 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 carry out the job of the, what we call the exchange reaction, right? So if you put that into the model, in addition to this one, what you find, and you say R is the, is the uh, characterize the frequency, it's our omega, right? Frequency, how often do you do that? That can also be measured, right? And in, in our model, what we find is that, indeed, if you don't have exchange, you don't have the order. This is the order parameter R, right? Synchronization order parameter R. Only when your exchange frequency is high enough, then you start to have order. And once you have order, the period actually doesn't depend on R, which is a good thing, right? So, of course, once you have exchange, R be introduced, then the exchange actually costs you more energy. So this baseline is this two ATP that assuming you don't have an exchange, such exchange monomer shuffling uh, mechanism will actually cost you energy. Of course, depending on the, the exchange energy, ex exchange interaction strengths, it depends. Uh, so this Delta, right? From here to here, count at least, at least in my mind, in our mind that actually count at least part of the en additional energy cost observed in uh, the 60, the total is 16 ATP per day that, so at least if not all, but part of the energy, excessive energy cost is being used for synchronization. So that's the basic take home message for this part. Okay, my time is running out. In the last five minutes or so, I'll tell you another recent story. Uh, so I'm gonna switch gear a little bit. So the recent story about inverse scaling of the dissipation rate. This story is also triggered by a puzzle. So I like puzzles. So, so, so a few years ago, I uh, went to a talk by Peter Foster here, and uh, who's, a, who's a student and post, now he's a postdoc uh, at, at the Dan Edelman's lab in Harvard. They, they actually developed with some collaborators, developed a very sensitive a calorimetry, a thermometer, basically. And calorimetry measured the heat dissipation. And this is a system that you have seen before in this uh, conference. It's an active flow system uh, that consists of kinesing, a microtubule with old ATP, of course. So they like to measure, they want to measure the dissipation by measure, using calorimetry, right? So in, in the system like this, they measured it and it turned out to be around 10 nanowatts. Okay. Then they did the following. They can also measure the movement of this microtube, right? By using tracer particle. And they can measure the flow velocity and the flow correlation lens, how large the flow, you know, persistent lens and viscosity, which is known very close to water and sample size, total volume, right? And the estimate based on the dissipation based on viscosity and velocity and persistent lens Hydrodynamics, right? They get the P, which is about 10 to the minus seven nanowatt, right? This is 10 nanowatt, 10 to the minus seven nanowatt. They, 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 they were very, very surprised. There's a 10 to the minus eight discrepancy between these two. And they, they, they said, maybe the efficiency is very, very low, 10 to the minus seven. Maybe that's true, but I don't see it that way. That's a different, different, different talk. But that got us to think about how does dissipation scale with land scale or scale? How does it scale with sort of coarse graining process? So we, we, we decided to do this by using a very simple, developing a simple model. The first on a, la on a regular lattice. So the model is in state space. Okay, I stress this is in state space. Each circle corresponds to a state, a distinctive state. This state can be in the chemical state, namely, number of molecules in different species, or it can be a physical state. This molecule is in position X, 
and it goes to position x plus delta x next day. So this ver the state variable can be generally understood as uh, uh, it can be both chemical and as well as physical coordinate. Okay. So the coordinate. So once you have these rates specified on these links, right, at the microscopic level, then you can start the cross screening process. And the cross screening process is extremely simple. You just say, okay, I want to loop, I want to group all these states together. By the way, this is very much in the spirit of Kadanov, real space RG, right? The process itself. So if you lump them together and you say that the macro, the mesoscopic state in the next level, the probability of in that state is basically the probability in all these four states, right? It's simple. Now, the next thing to do is that the course running in the course running in level, what about these rates, right? You cannot just say this has two rates. That you, you, so you, 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 you put them together, you say the rate between this mesoscopic state, let's put mesoscopic state, and this mesoscopic state basically preserve the current going one direction. So basically you can compute the turtle current going from I to J and divide by the probability of in the state I and that's your course green rate from I to J, right? Simple. So you can just carry out this process uh, forever. Right? Keep course green. At, at each level, at each level, you can compute each level S, you can compute the dissipation W dot, right? By following this fo same formula, each link carries out a current, net J I J is a net current, right? And minus JGI, the other, sorry, uh, JGI is a directional current and JGI is the other direction. You use the same formula to compute the entropy production uh, if you times KBT, that's the energy, energy dissipation rate. Um, you can compute that and you look at how does it scale as you keep going to coarser and coarser scale. And, and here it's in the X axis, it's basically N zero, the number of states in the microscopic level and number of state after you do uh, 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 course running S times, right? N of S. Of course, when you do course running, NS decreases and N zero over NS increases, right? So you do, you plot this log scale and you find, you follow it actually for this, what we call the random flux model where the original microscopic KIJ is all IID from a uh, distribution. It doesn't, the result doesn't depend on the distribution itself. As long as it's IID, you see the nice scaling behavior. And it depends on a few things. The exponent depends on DL. What is DL? DL is the scaling of the number of links versus number of number of states in the system, right? In the regular lattice, it's, it's just the dimension of the, of, of the, of the states you are in. Uh, C star is a correlation between a, a net flux and the other flux that are actually eventually going to merge with it, right? In the post screening process. And, and it follows this formula, okay? And, 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 and we, we, we numerically computed this and this equation is satisfied. And, and we, furthermore, we say, well, the inverse scaling law, what does it depend on? So we, we, we look at the, uh, the scaling uh, in various network, uh, and we found that scaling indeed do exist in scale-free network. Scale-free networks characterized by the minimum k-mean and exponent alpha, and for various choice of k-mean and, and, and all choice of alpha and k-mean, the scaling law seems to, seems to persist. And we have a relation between the exponent versus the uh, and dependence on the alpha and k-mean. Uh, I want to bore you about. But what we also find is that for other network, without self-similarity, like uh, the 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 Erdős rainy network and or the small world network, the scaling doesn't exist. Okay, so you don't you don't have a straight line? You you have some some kind of cross at most some crossover with it at best. Okay, so last two slides. People then are okay. We're sending the paper, and the referee says, "Oh, can you say something about real realistic biological systems?" So we did that. So we we take this approach. We look at the Brussel later model. Right, the Brussels laser model, the state space. This is the chemical space now, right? Chemicals, each dot corresponds to you have two type, two type of molecule X and Y. Each dot corresponds to the molecule number NX and then Y, right? This is the coordinate. So this is the chemical space. 
And this really corresponds to chemical reaction, right? So you actually can cross screen the chemical reaction. And basically the cross screening in chemical reaction basically amounts to your measurement uh, uh, accuracy or your measurement resolution of your measurement, right? N number of molecules. You cannot have single molecule measurement. You can only say, you know, roughly uh, modular 10 or so on. So that's the kind of uh, core screening that you can think of, right? And indeed, even in this realistic system, we actually also see after the initial uh, uh, core screening, the remaining core screening process does follow our law with exponents. And, and same goes for a system that actually originally get us started, right? The, the kinesium microtubule active flow system. So we, we came up with a simple model which take into account the polarity of uh, microtubule. Microtubule have basically uh, four orientation order, right? Left and right, plus or minus, right, left, up, down, and, uh, uh, and down, up, right? And we, 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 we simplify the 2D model like that. Of course, you can or, or orient in any direction it wants. And the, the, the polarity determines the kin kinesium molecule only going uh, towards uh, the, the plus n, right, of the, of the microtubule. And if you do that, again, you we again see very nice scaling lambda with uh, 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 some, some value of exponent. Now, going back to the puzzle in the very beginning, where does the 10 to the minus 8 come from? So if you just do a simple analysis about the uh, using the, the L0, the microscopic scale, as the kinesium persistent length, how long does it run before it drops off? So roughly around 0 0.6 to 1 micron. And active flow scale, as they, as they show in their paper, is 100 micrometer. And if you take that and use the estimate of the 3D exponent lambda 3D, and you get a number of 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 8.5 or so. So that's actually within the range of 10 to the minus 8. We're not saying these are the right number quantitatively. We're saying definitely if you estimate dissipation at the core screen scale, it's going to be vastly underestimate the actual cost, which has a microscopic scale. OK, this brings me to the last actual slides of my talk. It's an interesting comparison. Uh, so just focus on the left. Um, this is what we studied, right? In biological system, this is the scale. Energy is really injected at a microscopic scale, a small scale. Right, your ATP reaction, your, your ATP uh, hydrolysis happened at a very small land scale. Okay, and your observation may happen somewhere here. So what I have shown you is that if you measure your dissipation somewhere here, it's gonna it's gonna be over, uh, it's gonna be underestimate, and the, 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 it actually can follow a power law, very significant underestimate, right? And this is this is what we call inverse cascade. And, and this is actually a very interesting comparison. People often remind people of uh, the cascade, energy cascade in uh, fully developed turbulence, the Kolmogorov cascade. Of course, Kolmogorov cascade is, by, is looking at different quantity uh, and also the, the physics is totally different, right? There, the energy is injected at the large land scale, right? A small cave. And the energy is not dissipated in the intermediate scale. It only dissipated at the small land scale, right? At, at the viscous land scale. And in between, Komogorov basically has an estimate of what is energy density in the, in the, in the, in the in, in, in particular land scale and how does the scale with the scale. But you see this line, it doesn't taper down, right? This is what we're trying to show here is that actually dissipation in biological systems uh, it's very different. Dissipation happens in all scale. See, to the red line happens in all scale. And the, the smaller the scale, the dissipation is higher. And as a result, the dissipation that happens at the scale that you observe may be very, very, a very, very tiny fraction of the total dissipation, right? So that's why, why the tapered uh, 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 arrow is, is, is trying to tell you. This paper, by the way, is also recently published in PRL. By I mean the main author is a, an amazing young undergraduate student from Peking University. All right, okay. Let me summarize. Maybe I don't have I, just by putting up the slides. Um, I think for the for the last uh, uh, you know twenty years or so, we've been trying to understand the biochemical 
circuit with a with a lens of non-equivalent physics, right? I think first take home message is very, very, very simple. Uh, the living system are in non-equivalent steady state. The resting energy actually you, you have to you, the function has to be maintained by continuous energy consumption, right? I say continuous, it's not just if you want to do something, you pay you pay it. No, just maintain the state, you keep paying it, right? So that's what I'm trying to say. And that maintenance cost, energy cost, continuous energy cost really is the one that limits the optimum performance, as we show in two systems in adaptation and, and in also accuracy of, uh, of biochemical oscillation. And I told you a little bit about dissipation it can occur in all different scales. And there may be a scaling in certain type of neural, a certain type of uh, a, a biochemical network. Obviously more needs to be done to figure out whether they are the universality class and determine the exponent and so on and so forth. Okay, for that I close and I thank you for your attention. And thank you for staying at the <laughs> towards <laughs> at the very end of the conference, I, which I really, really enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Yuhai. I was really fascinated by all the story you told us. Really, really amazing. So we are running a bit late, but we have time for at least one question from the audience. I apologize because before I was told that I missed some raised hands. I hope not to do so this time. No questions over there. Let me ask you some, just one curiosity. I was very surprised to see these uh, monomers in the synchronization problem, that the way they have to, to synchronize is actually they exchange the components. That's really, I mean, I found it rather weird. Right? I could imagine yeah. simpler ways just to communicate send some chemical or something, rather than having to dis disassemble the whole thing just to get uh, to talk together. I mean, yeah, that's actually you're, you're right. I mean, there are other me proposed mechanisms that actually do that. Um, but what we what we think is that first of all, the monomer shoveling is actually an observed phenomenon, right? It's we we didn't say this is we want to synchronize, and therefore we find out this is the way to do it. So it, you observe it. And, and second, it's not so simple to uh, exchange some chemical because that chemical will then have to regulate, uh, will have to tell the other clock to stop, right? If you are faster, this chemical has to be able to somehow regulate the kinetics mm -hmm. of the, the targeted, uh, the target uh, 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 hexamer, right? So in this case, by exchanging, right? It's just saying we're doing averaging. So, you see that the 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 the, the mm -hmm. time is really encoded in the total phosphorylation rate, right? So if, if I go back to here, this is sort of a better. Ah, yes. If you look, if you look at here, if if you are at uh, uh, twelve o'clock, right, zero, mm -hmm. and I am at six o'clock, if I exchange partner, we are we are closer. We're going to be closer. Maybe not extremely as as sweet sweet, but we have to be closer, right? So that's it's a much more direct way of synchronizing by averaging, basically. And, 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 and yeah, it sounds very dramatic that the hexamer can explode and reassemble, but that's what they observe. And, and the reason they, they, uh, they, it can happen easily is another thing that puzzled people, biologists, for a long time is that other than the domain two that actually have these phosphorylation sites, there's also domain one for each uh, monomer, a chi-C monomer. Domain one is known to be an ATPase. So we also know, not only we know that the, the assemble and disassemble, we also know the additional energy is, is, is spent by this uh, uh, C1 domain, which goes through the ATPase activity. Wonderful. So there, there are many, many things that are pointing towards uh, 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 this as, as a, at least one of the viable mechanism for synchronization. Okay, we have time for the last question of the seminar. Shi Yu, oh. sorry for the pronunciation. Oh, uh, hi, hi, you, hi. Uh, this is uh, Drea from uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, it, it's really nice talk. Thank you. This is really fantastic to see those many interesting models. I have a quick question related to the last one you just uh, talked about on the uh, uh, the low dissipation that one observe on the larger scale, but it's supported by the 
uh, much higher dissipation at the lower scale. I right. wonder if you can make uh, some comments or maybe even connections into the higher level or complicated intelligent uh, behavior or even uh, macroscopic pattern uh, formation in the uh, in living systems can somehow you can attribute those missing uh, missing dissipation into the uh, uh, well to, to support the, the the complicated pattern formations or intelligent behaviors that show up emerge on the larger scale. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's it's a good question. I, I don't know. So so what we observed is that I mean you're absolutely right. I mean so. If I go back to the example, so this is a good question, I think, for following, for follow up. Uh, wait a second. How do I go backwards? Oops. Ah. Uh, too many. Uh, no, no, no. I should go forward. No, I'm just going to say. Um, we don't know, I mean, you're talking about a, a, in a realistic system, like we, we studied here, right? For example, here. If you look at here, what, what the, the, the real uh, function of this, this network is that it's supporting some kind of oscillation, right? So some kind of macroscopic oscillation. You see the, this dipping here? That's the scale of the oscillation itself. So if you look at in this, in this, in this, Space space, and you look at the the the, the flow of the of the system, in and then you find that there's actually a persistent flow of this scale of this scale that happens because that's the that's the oscillation that's actually the biochemical oscillation that's supported by bacillator model. So all this energy, so you you're spending the energy here for burning ATP at this each individual link, and the targeted collective behavior you're supporting is here, right? So you actually somehow has to propagate energy from here to here to support the structure that you, you, that, that you want. And there's no way for me to do that directly by just go from here to here, but by through some kind of transport process. And but that transport process itself also dissipates. So that's what the, 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 the this leak in this uh, in this picture uh, that I showed, right? So if you want to send energy to here, but you can only send it here, right? What are you going to do? You just have some some coupling between different scales, but those coupling are dissipated. That's what I'm trying to say. Unlike unlike in turbulence, these couplings are are inertia. So th these are inertia rings. It doesn't dissipate energy. So that's the difference. I think maybe it's easy done in. From, from, from a large scale to smaller scale, much harder from smaller scale to large scale. There may be some, some principle there, but I don't know. But on, on surface, this is what, what you want to do. So you have energy source here. You want to create a structure or function in here. How, how are you going to do that? You got, you're going to a couple of different scales and that coupling, and at least in the, in the system we study, all dissipates energy. And as a result, the amount of energy that shows here, I mean, materialized here is rather, rather small compared okay. to the, the, the input. Yeah, that, that's really cool. So, so maybe, so if, if you state the, your, your problem now from the small scale to large scale, can, can we interpret this result as if you observe some large scale uh, uh, interesting dynamics or intelligent behavior or, or pattern formation, you, and you know it is not done by a driving force at that scale, but done by some much smaller scale. Then you can actually predict a lower bound of dissipation that is required to actually. Yeah. Sustain. So that's a good question. So, so, so there's a lot of design can be done right here. You can imagine. Suppose your 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 original microscopic cost is fixed, and you want to generate some pattern here, which definitely at that level you're costing something. You know the cost. And, yeah. and the question is, can you engineer the slope to be shallower, right? Right, right. Yeah, I guess it, it also depends on the noise or all, all those. Uh, like well, it depends on the, the, the these uh, kin kinetics, right? So, so right now, all the, the exponent actually does depends on, see, see we, we do see different exponents. So here, for example, we see this exponent. And for mm -hmm. this system, we see this exponent. Oh, it all depends. The reason is that it all depends on what what is in this k, right? What is the, what is in this k? 
and what is the architecture of the network and what is in this K and what, you know, they have more. So, so there's a lot of maybe engineering you could do by changing different reaction and introducing more interact, uh, reactions to at least yeah. changing this, uh, change this exponent. Yeah, well, that, that's really interesting. I definitely would love to follow up with you later. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, that, no, thank you. So yeah. thank you again, Yuhai, for the wonderful, really wonderful talk. And uh, it's the last one of, of the seminar. So please, I don't know if Pedro Garrido wants to say a few closing words or we just say bye-bye um, to the people. No, I, I think that there is another person that wants to ask something. Sadi Kosi Isasi. Please. Please, Sadi, could you make the question? No. Okay. I don't know. Maybe it's a mistake. Yeah, maybe. Okay, then uh, let's uh, thanks to the speakers first, of course. Second, uh, thanks to all the participants for being here for in these two weeks of uh, seminar. And uh, let us uh, meet uh, in two years here in Granada, uh, finally, and uh, probably in a mixed type of presentations, no? Because these Zoom meetings maybe are worth to to uh, to, to, to use them no, in, in the future. And uh, thanks uh, the technical staff and everyone. Uh, see you soon. Bye. Okay. See you, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you to the speakers. Bye bye. 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 Bye.